Welcome to the XY Advisor Podcast, a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. This series is brought to you by PIMCO, one of the world's leading fixed income managers. For 50 years, PIMCO has been dedicated to helping millions of investors pursue their objectives regardless of shifting market conditions. At PIMCO, ESG investing is an essential part of their commitment to delivering on their clients' objectives, while at the same time supporting long-term sustainable economic growth globally. Hello and welcome back to the XY Advisor podcast. We are at the fifth and final episode of a five-part series on ESG investing. And in this particular episode, we're really focusing in on the different asset classes. It is super easy to dive straight into equities as the thing that we look for when it comes to ESG investing. Uh, but as we know, we're rounding out any particular portfolio. We really need to understand what a balanced portfolio looks like and what other things we could look at. So in in this episode, we really do tackle what are the asset classes when it comes to ESG investing. Welcome back, Nathan. Thank you. Thank you for joining us in this final episode of this series. We're talking about asset classes. Tell tell us uh, tell us all about the asset classes when it comes to ESG investing. I think in Australia, if you look back ten years ago and what we options we had, we had the perpetual SRI Australian fund. And that was it. That was the only option. And globally, there was so many. Yeah, a massive variety of options. And then we saw a couple of international ones. We saw AMP move into the space a bit. Um, we saw one or two fixed interests coming up. But really now you can invest in a, in a responsible manner that is a considered manner in different ways across obviously Australian and international equities. I'd say the international space have far more choice and selection, um, particularly in the impact side of things. And Australian companies tend to be more laggard global than, rather than global companies in making change. Um, but you know, there are impact funds available in Australia now, the ones that directly drive into sustainability. I think fixed interest has always been a tricky one. I think the, the, you know, we had ESG orientated fixed interest funds, but we are going to see very soon uh, a number of green bond funds coming in. So, you know, where you've got fixed interest that is ESG orientated, that's looking at the, the issuer of the debt and deciding if the issuer of the debt has a, has a positive outcome. We've got a couple of hybrids that kind of consider the issuer and the purpose of the particular bond they, they drive. But what we are going to start seeing is the, the purpose of that bond being the main point. And that'll see, it's really interesting, things like BNP Paribas, massive investment bank issue, you know, they're the world leader in both fossil fuel and um, renewable bay or green bonds. Like they, they, they do both. So judging the bond based off their issuer as opposed to their outcome is, is very hard. But I also see it, 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 asset classes are all about diversification. You know, I think in financial planning, we kind of got stuck on this whole, here's the the licensee driven asset allocation. You've got this many Australian and international equities and fixed interests. And then remember after the GFC alternatives became the big thing and they just let everyone down. And um, and you've got, you know, massive scale infrastructure projects at you know, fixed assets at, at super funds. The reason we do this is the most basic principle of, of investment and that's diversification. So when thinking about asset classes, people often look for, okay, where's a property fund that I can get involved in, which is, which is quite tricky in this space. You know, green property is still an emerging area. And what that means is hard and it tends to be put into portfolios with a variety of other things. I don't think we've seen the real emergence of quality green property funds. There's a fair bit of greenwashing in that sector as it is. Um, and, and when I say green, I'm talking both environmentally friendly, but also things like social housing and that kind of thing. I think there's so much competition in, in property that it's very difficult to create value in that shift because you can get the money otherwise. You don't have to worry about whether it's green or not. Um, but I think infrastructure is a really interesting one because when we think infrastructure, we think you know power generation, we think airports. Uh, and that's you know, straight away. But Infrastructure is societal tools. They're things that provide benefit to society as a whole. They tend to have long-running um, flat performance curves, inflation-linked, um, and tend to be less correlated with equity markets. Tend to, I mean, they tend to be on equity markets, but they, they're less volatile. 
The reason we invest in infrastructure is diversification, it's consistency of cash flow, it's inflation um, you know, combating characteristics. But what is it? Well, it's it can be anything that benefits society. And the, I, I've, I've had this conversation a number of times. If you're looking down the impact pathway, if you're looking at the impact portion of your portfolio, you're looking at water, food, waste control, you're looking at energy generation, you're looking at healthcare, you're looking, these are all infrastructure-based products. To move to a more circular regenerative economy, we need to rethink the way we look at the commoditized nature of a lot of these things. You know, If we've got completely renewable energy, no one buys and sells energy. You just pay someone for the rights to transmit it to your house. That's a complete rethink in the operation of that business model. Um, and we need to make sure that these companies have time to adjust because they're pushing back because they that's not their business model. But you also think about the diversification aspects. Healthcare and um, food production aren't inherently correlated. They might be causative in some manners. You know, good food production leads to less healthcare costs, but that gives you greater diversity in your portfolio. So when constructing a, an ethical portfolio for a client, don't just go back to the classic equity, this you know, percentage of property, blah, blah, blah. Look at what underlying themes are. Look to the impact investments and say, what are they holding? And is that inherently um, diversified? And what I've found in my own research doing when I do quant tools on my portfolios is that if you're familiar with the risk return chart, the further left in the right-hand corner you go, the lower the volatility, the higher the performance. And we, we, whenever you add impact investments into a portfolio, you always move left because of that uncorrelated approach. So it's it's not saying, oh, we need, you know, office buildings and airports. It's saying, what is infrastructure? Why do we include diverse assets? And what else can we include? What opportunities are that we've never even considered before that can actually add extreme value to the portfolios and reduce volatility and risk? Amazing. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you for all of that. I've been uh, taking note seriously. Um, talk to me about the concept of, you know, uh, power in, in the airports. You mentioned infrastructure is a big thing. And I sort of had some more questions on this. Uh, obviously, you know, airports get people around, but they also, um, you know, land and, and take off a lot of planes, which creates a lot of um, uh, impact on the environment. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I think if more people who own private jets uh, flew via airports, we'd probably have less of an issue. Uh, the old Leo DiCaprio flying to a climate change conference in his private jet. I think air transportation will transition. Uh, we've got hydrogen-based technology for air transportation already. Uh, it's a bit difficult with high-torque electric-based engines. There are some great stuff happening in trains in the in the um, in the United States. Is one company that does high um, freight train networks that is developing uh, into um, completely electrically driven. And once we develop strong torque electric engines, that'd be good. I also think there's multiple fuel sources. So a few years ago, there was a um, a, a drone being developed in Australia, actually, um, which had a hydrogen takeoff mechanism, but a solar um, cruise mechanism because the amount of energy required once at height and speed was much less. So we're going to see that kind of thing. I think planes will ch- shift. I think they will. I think we will see that naturally occur. There is a lot of research going in there and it's an easy problem to solve. It's the electric car problem. It's alternative fuel sources. And then all of a sudden, flights don't tend to be such an issue. Um, but I also think, you know, if you look at the the transition of, of COVID, the requirement to fly around the world to go to conferences when you're a business person is, is less. So we're going to see that that shift and change and move and, and transportation will inherently be less due to the gift of COVID, which said, hey, you don't actually have to be there to be there. So, yeah, it's an, it is an interesting one the airports play. I don't think they're going away anytime soon. Um, I think it's up to the airport, how it manages its uh, its flows um, because that can make a drastic difference. And then the, the, the aeroplane companies themselves need to transition. They do have a monopoly in that sense as an industry. Um, but I think consumer demand it hasn't been there because no one's been flying. But I, I do see that being a massive push. And there is research going in the space. There's plenty. It, it's a simple problem to solve. Uh, it's an engineering problem. It's not. There's not a complex social system we need to unwind. Yep. Uh, and I know there's a lot of industries that are doing their bit. Uh, I've been listening to some of well, some of the music industries doing, for example, a lot of bands now are trying to be carbon neutral from you know traveling around and you know travel and, and air transports. One of the biggest um, one of the biggest issues that they're trying to solve for. Um, I want to talk to you a bit more about um, the the green bond funds and, and the fact that um, they're you know that's. That's a sort of starting point from the from the money that's being lent to the companies only interested in, in whether they, they're, they're green or not. 
Yeah, so a, a green bond is about purpose. So it's it which is great for client interaction too. Because you can say this bond was lent to this company to do this thing. Like or created to lend money to this company. To the, it, it's it, it's an enormously impactful thing because it's when we talk about impact in previous episodes, we talked about the idea that you've got implied impact through to actual impact. And a green bond is saying it's implied impact. I'm buying fixed interest products from a, a bank that is better than another bank. Therefore, my portfolio is is better. That's implied impact. This is real impact. This is saying, you know, I mentioned before, we've lent money to a, um, a halfway home for uh, 55 to 65-year-old women to find support and refuge from domestic violence, from their own circumstances, um, whatever they may be. We want to support them to get back on their feet. And you're going to get a, a fixed rate of 3% on that but you're also getting a better outcome. And if you look at the interest rate market at the moment, and we talk performance, I find this really interesting. If I said to you, you can get 1% on your bond portfolio or you can get 1% on your bond portfolio and provide a house for 450 um, homeless women to get back on their feet, what are you going to choose? You know, it's I think with fixed interest markets, the returns being so low, but we need that diversification in our portfolio, this just adds another another reason to continue having it instead of shifting you know there's a lot of conversation around shifting away from the old 60 40 instead of shifting out of bonds altogether which some people are starting to do i think this adds a, a layer of um of benefit that is you know that greater beneficiary that also allows the safety net on portfolios um should you know things go the other way in equity markets nathan thanks so much for coming on and chatting to us during this series if someone wants to continue the conversation what's the best way for them to get hold of you linkedin is absolutely the easiest and best way connect with me on linkedin shoot me a message and then depending on which channel you want to engage me through uh, whether that be getting help with ethical investment conversations whether that be ethos whether that be good for the bay whatever that is um, more than happy to chat to anyone but linkedin is the way to do it thank you nathan and people can tune into your podcast what's it called it's good for the B podcast. Uh, and if you're interested in this space or you want to upskill in what's happening in these worlds, um, but not specifically about investments, then uh, that's the intent of the podcast. Wonderful. And what's good for the B is good for the hive. That's right. Other way around, Fraser, but you're getting there. <laughs> I'll get there eventually. Thanks, mate. Karen, thanks so much for joining us in this final episode. We are talking about all the different asset classes and, and as we've previously spoken about, delivering different ethical investment solutions for clients. Uh, tell us about how the conversations you're having with your clients about diversifying the portfolio. It's been a pleasure to be part of the series. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, yeah, I think that I'd just really encourage advisors to, to act that's the, the first thing is to really act and, and understand that they can deliver an ethical investment solution or a responsible investment solution for their client. And it might not be perfect, but it's a step in the right direction. Have that growth mentality and be honest and open with your client about what you're delivering. And there will be, there will be parts of the portfolio that might not quite suit what they're after, but just be frank and disclose that would be my um, step and say that you know, the financial sector is moving in the right direction and, and we're getting traction. And, you know, as their key trusted advisor, you will do your utmost to ensure that, you know, when a better opportunity or a better fund or a stronger screen is available, you will let them know. Yep. So that, yeah, that would be my first suggestion um, is don't wait for perfection. Just get in there and, and get ready. It sounds like a bit of a, uh, a part of an art, part of a science uh, and, a, and, a, and a shifting sand. So uh, prepare your clients for a few uh, shifts along the way. Exactly. And remember that, you know, investments come in all shapes and sizes. And, you know, you might find that, you know, you can blend an active international equities manager with a passive ETF that's focused on Australian shares. You might build a sh direct share portfolio for them that's really you know, focus on some really innovative um, medical, healthcare, climate change solutions, or you know, you or you might find a, a wonderful social bond fund. You might buy direct bonds. You, you can build a portfolio that's as unique as your clients. If you do the due diligence, you know, s firstly, you know, find a fund to research, get some ideas perhaps from your. Um, you know, the Responsible Investment Association or from the Ethical Advisors Cooperative website or even from Lonsec or your dealer group, get the full holdings list, you know, ask them some really good questions. 
um, ask them about their philosophy and their process. You know, are they a signatory to the Responsible Investment Association or the United Nations Principles for Responsible Investment? Do they even produce a sustainability report? Like how long have they been doing this? Like I will always find it interesting and somewhat mm, concerning when a fund puts out an ethical fund and that's the only one they do of the 15 that they run. So like what's their philosophy and culture around responsible investment? Is this the only fund they do or is this all that they do? Why do they have that investment process? You know, how long has their team been doing this? What's their expertise? What's their background? You know, are they engineers? Are they medical um, specialists? How will they know what they're looking for? Um, So that's you're looking for an edge for your clients. Um, And you also want to make sure you're protecting your client from greenwash. And there there is a lot of that. But by asking really good questions, um, you can uncover whether or not the fund is as authentic as the marketing flyers say. Um, And I would encourage you to also have a look at the research that the Responsible Investment Association for Australasia does, uh, which is on responsiblereturns.org. And also the Ethical Advisors Cooperative does some leaf ratings or do your own research. Um, And this, this is a really powerful way that you can demonstrate to your clients that you are really close to these funds and you understand what they're invested in. Yeah. Incredible. And, uh, and I, I feel like when advisors enter this space, the, the easy go-to is just to, to look at equities. Well, like obviously, you, you know, you'll diversify. Tell us about that and about how you then move from, uh, have conversations with clients around not just having equities in their portfolio. True. And the equities are exciting and wonderful to explain to clients because clients will understand them. But I think you could build on that to say that because – of the transition that is occurring, there is a great innovation in other asset classes. So you could give examples about you know, environmental and social impacts they can deliver through um, social and green bonds, for example, in the fixed income space. And you could also talk in the property space, of course, you know, you only have to look around to see that there's a massive amount of transformation needed in the, the built environment space when you're thinking about retrofitting buildings, like who pays for that? Like Lendlease did a green bond a couple of years ago now, and that was capital raised purely designed to retrofit their building portfolio. So clients can be a part of that was paying around 4%, you know. Um, so clients may, you know, if you ask them, want to be part of those investment solutions that are really transforming um, our real infrastructure, so beyond equities. Yep. And uh, you mentioned in one of the early episodes around uh, property uh, and some, talk to us about what some of the different property options are when it comes to what's, what, you know, what they're investing in. Sure. I think you know, property can be um, you know, really what your clients are after. So do ask them. But we, we notice with our clients that they really are interested in, um, well, these are the areas we've gone into. So specialist disability accommodation for NDIS recipients it might be aged care or high care li- living, um, student accommodation, uh, TAFEs, uh, so education type precincts, childcare centres, for example, as well as other social infrastructure, whether it might be um, law courts, for example, um, bus depots, as well as other sorts of um, investments like social housing. Australia's got a massive social housing crisis. So there's a government authority that's just issued um, Australia's biggest social housing bond, as well as lots of other things that are transforming the way that we live in Australia, like light rail and solar farms and bikeways. So, yeah, there's many ways clients can get involved. Um, And importantly, with really good quality credit and good quality um, property managers as well. These are not niche or fad type investments. Um, they're with household names that you would know. Yeah, it certainly um, it adds so many different aspects to the portfolio and, and conversation pieces again that they can that they can chat to their friends about. Uh, how do you see this um, this conversation going with regards to different asset classes with the clients yeah, over the long term? Because obviously things will change with regards to portfolios and, and how, how do you have these conversations with the clients and sort of reviews and moving their portfolio around? I think it's just about making sure, you know, you really, you know, you listen to what they're after and if they're not sure, you know, it's an invitation to treat. Like you're just saying this exists, would this be something that you're after, you know, and you could compare, for example, a regular bond fund 
with a green bond fund and show past performance and you could show the different outcomes and see what resonates with them best. So um, you're really providing them with options. That's, that's what our job is. And by providing them with those options, then they can make an informed decision because they don't know what they don't know. So if they don't know these products exist and you haven't told them about them and then they find out after, you know, and they end up outperforming the mainstream ones, that, you know, that's probably a position you don't want to be in if they've previously asked for exposure to this. And yeah. Secondly, I think it's also something really nice to talk about as well because clients are seeing the impacts of climate change day to day. Like you only have to think about your own electricity bill, your own water bill, you know, your own food bill. We know that with scarcity comes higher prices. So if you can set your portfolio up to be better across these future impacts, why wouldn't you? Hmm. It seems it seems to me from, from our conversation that it's really about the conversation around giving the client the choice, the buy-in to have the conversation, to make those decisions rather than just coming and saying, here, this, you should be invested in this. These are our, these are our funds, et cetera, et cetera. Definitely. And, and treat them with respect because clients are intelligent and they will have views on these issues. And so don't presume anything. I think that's probably, um, you know, you might have an idea which you think is wonderful, but if it doesn't resonate with them, that's okay. Um, you know, it, it can just be a starting point for a conversation. There's no right or wrong answers in this. It's just, it's just a means to, um, you know, a conversation to get to that next point. And, you know, you might re revisit that topic at the next review and you might find that their views on something have completely changed because of what's been happening in the world. And I think the bushfires certainly were a point where people suddenly became much more, um, they could completely resonate, you know, with, um, how they wanted to set their portfolios up when they saw that happening. Clients were calling really frightened. New clients were saying, take my money now. You know, like I want to be completely protected by what's happening and I want to be across all of these issues because climate change is here. It's like on our doorstep. What are we doing? And, you know, you have to remember this is what a point where none of our children could go play sport for those weeks. Like you, could, you couldn't even get out the door. The, the, the smoke was so thick. So like what future do we have on this planet when we can't leave the building? So I think that really, yeah, that really struck home with a lot of people. Um, yeah. They don't want to be contributing to that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Karen, thanks so much for coming on this series and, and, and talking to us. If someone wants to continue the conversation with you, what's the best way they can reach out? Certainly. Uh, look, I would really encourage any advisors that um, want to get involved in this space to please consider becoming um, a responsible investment advisor um, with our association, RIA. And then following on from that, um, you know, there are many financial advisor forums we run and there's a certification process you can go through and many mentors that will assist you. Um, and one of those mentor groups is the Ethical Advisors Cooperative. Um, and we began that because we wanted to, you know, reach out to new members um, and new advisors and give them support. We run a, um, a peer group session and we also have um, a leaf ratings uh, research section on our website and um, we're building a toolkit at the moment for new advisors as well. So we're really trying to provide you with all of the, you know, the tools to really get out there and start delivering ethical investment solutions for your clients. Thank you so much. And just just uh, confirming the uh, RIA the, uh, is in a, the association is Australasian. It's it's not just in Australia. And the that's ethical correct. the yes. ethical advisor co-op is it that's Australian based. Um, we also have extended our uh, constitution to include New Zealand. So, yes, we can now do both. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, we look forward to, uh, well, thank you so much for being part of this, this series and I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you for your interest and thanks to everyone that's listened to the series. I hope it really does inspire you to get out there and just get started. Don't be overwhelmed. Just get, get started. David Graham, welcome back to this conversation. We're talking about uh, different a, different asset classes within uh, within portfolios. Obviously, equities uh, is the easy one to talk about. It's the popular one. Uh, but tell us about uh, how your conversation that you have with the clients about other asset classes. Thanks, Fraser. Yeah, this has been um, growing quite rapidly, as you would know, over the past few years. Um, you know, we've always had I don't want to use the term fringe dweller as derogatory, but there's people been out there like your Australian ethical funds and these sort of people have been doing this for a very long time and for very specific reasons. Um, from about um, 
2017, we started to see an emergence of um, other uh, fund managers across various asset classes who were starting to get interested in, in this subject. Um, clearly, there was some, some demand from uh, maybe their institutional side, I assume, but um, they were certainly having conversations with, with uh, advisors and researchers about, um, you know, how would you feel about a, a, um, an ESG version of a, of a, a bond fund or, or, or anything in another asset class? So that, that's... Um, Central grown exponentially since since 2017, uh, and I again supply and demand. Who who knows where where it started? You know, it, it may it may well start in the institutional land where um you know some of the bigger super funds have have um had a specific uh, uh, approach they wanted to, and you know that that's filtered into into retail world now. So it, it's really just come to the point. Um, and the, one of the reasons we adopted these portfolios a year or so ago when we had our reset uh, was we could finally put hand on heart and say we can build a, a um, properly diversified portfolio across most asset classes um, with sufficient managed diver- diversification and, and style to um, to replace what we're using up to that point. Yeah, so, so uh, it's only been recently that a lot of these products, uh, uh, you know, opportunities, I guess you could call them, um, for the for the portfolio have been available? Yeah, yeah. And, and even now, the, the, there's probably a couple of little gaps we'd still like to see filled, but um, uh, I have no doubt they'll be filled um, fairly shortly. And I guess the other the other part of that is as well is that uh, we do have the capacity now to have to pick from a, a range of managers, but it's still dwarfed by the the, the broader, um, you know, non-denominational, you know, fund manager space, if you like. Yeah, fair enough. And um, uh, and but but you're expecting that space to to change over time, obviously, with the supply and demand equation. I would think so. And there's there's potentially a bit of a race on there. Anyway, I think we said in an earlier podcast that um, you know there's a bit of um, rebranding by a lot of funds going on, and a lot of funds are looking at things, saying, "Well, let's um, start excluding tobacco, for example." You know, Ten years too late, perhaps, but it's moving people in the right direction. Uh, so you, you can say, well, that's tick one box, and th- these boxes are slowly, slowly moving in the right direction. Um, a little while back, um, I don't know if you know um, Giles Gunasekera. Um, he, he works in the impact investing space. Uh, in, in a, in a, in a um, conversation with him at, at a conference, he basically said he didn't think ESG investing would invest in, it would exist in ten years' time because it would just be the norm. So there's this kind of dynamic at the moment where it's all moving in that direction to, to some point. You know, you might get to the stage where um, we talked earlier about having a, just a, a unique class of people investing uniquely in, in an ethical fund. You might have, it might end up being, you know, in 10 years' time, you have a unique class of person investing in a unique fossil fuels fund, which is out there on the fringe. Yeah, that would be an interesting space. Your specialist well, investor strange, in tobacco stranger or something. things have happened, yeah. haven't they? <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And so, obviously, a huge, um, uh, you know, demand in that space. T- talk to us about the the different asset classes, though, because I mean, obviously, if we take away e- equities, uh, how are you finding um, the rest of the the asset classes, maybe property or, or debt? Yeah. So, so um, clearly, clearly, as we said, the evolution started with the. Um, uh, equities and that's got the broadest range of, of products available. Um, with, with some of the bigger players starting to go into the the, the uh, fixed income asset class, for example, uh, I think that's dragging a lot of their competitors with them as well. So it's creating its own momentum. It's still a little bit narrow, um, certainly compared to equities. Um, but as I said before, it, it's just enough that we can get you know ninety percent of the portfolio in there. Um, property is kind of interesting because it's it's Difficult to say how, how you define what boxes you're ticking in that in that sustainable space with property. Um, you know, you drill down to uh, uh, the property owner, the tenants. Um, you know, what's built out of all, all these kind of things doesn't have solar solar panels on all this sort of stuff. Um, so, you know, we're just advisors. We we really need to rely on credible researchers to filter through that and really put to us what the uh, limitations are and and the potential benefits. So uh, I think uh, you can't necessarily expect uh, a portfolio to tick every box that everybody has because everybody will, will go, you know, fairly um, idiosyncratic if you draw down and say, well, I like this and I don't like that. And, you know, there's all sorts of preferences. You can't really build a portfolio there. There has to be trade-offs in everything. I mean, you have a trade-off when you put some of your portfolio into bonds, not all into equities, right? So it's, it's about the risk management side. Um, 
So you still have to work those trade-offs in. And um, you know, if you can't find a sustainable alternative, well, you still have to invest in that part of the portfolio uh, to get your asset allocation right for your client. So you know, it, it, it sounds like I'm uh, prevaricating here a little bit about sustainability, but there are practicalities involved in making sure that the portfolio is, is um, um, properly managed from a risk perspective. Yeah, exactly right. Now, now the um, I'm, in, I'm just trying to work in my head around um, green property as well. Uh, <laughs> is this something like uh, that might become more prevalent now that there is, um, you know, there is a real, uh, you know, carbon net zero type target? Is a is a green property a, a tree farm or a or a solar farm or those sorts of things? What you know, what what are they? Well, it, it, that's exactly right. It, it can certainly expand the definition of, of property. I think um, you know it, it could. Um, uh, theoretically, I guess, expand into the area of um, uh, carbon sequestration and, and those kind of things. We don't really see that yet at the moment, but um, to your point earlier about technology and innovation, uh, if the incentive is there to, to build those kind of things, um, you know, in the infrastructure space, maybe we're talking about uh, solar farms and wind farms and those kind of things, which, which already exist in the infrastructure funds. So um, in that space, in that uh, property space, we tend to bucket infrastructure and property in the same space because it has some similar attributes. It often, or more often than not, refers back to you know, a physical asset and, a, and um, quite often a, a regular rental type income stream as well. So uh, if we look at that asset class a little bit more broadly, we can kind of um, find a, little, a few more boxes to tick. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Uh, David, thanks so much for coming on and sharing your wisdom with us. Uh, tell us if somebody wants to continue the conversation with you, what would be the best way for them to get hold of you? That's a good question. You can um, catch me on LinkedIn. Uh, I'm there. Um, I'm not on Facebook because that just upsets me. <laughs> uh, or or uh, if you go to our webpage, storywealth.com.au, um, you'll find my contact details there. Wonderful. Thank you, David. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Claudia and Michelle, welcome back to this episode. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Hi Fraser. Fraser. Uh, we are talking about asset classes and, uh, and you know, we sort of think about and we've always sort of thought about this, or I certainly have anyway, when it comes to portfolios around uh, ESG, that equities were where the main uh, action is happening. Um, but, of course, we, we mentioned diversification in previous episodes. Tell us tell us about uh, how we diversify uh, using uh, or now in the ESG space. Well, we all, we're always looking for um, full portfolio solutions. So we want to have some, a solution for all our clients across the asset classes. And, you know, let's say 10 years ago, there, it was difficult to find ethical solutions that suited our clients in, say, fixed interest and property, but equities was available. But what we've seen over the last, let's say, 10 years is, solutions or and ethically screened solutions across all the asset classes really would you say Claudia? Yeah yeah and I think that's why um, you know our our clients 30 years ago were more active in the equity space because that's where they knew they could champion their values mm. um, and 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 then but now we've we we're able to provide a ethical portfolio covering the main four asset classes um, just like any, you know, just like a... Any other financial advice? Yeah. yeah. And, and what we did originally, like early days, we, we put together our own direct equity portfolios, which, you know, were very transparent, obviously, and clients knew exactly the sort of investments they were invested in. And then out of that, and that was 20 years ago, we had we developed our own sort of platform, let's say. I mean, now the platforms are hugely more powerful and that's fantastic because we can utilise the technology there. But out of developing our own portfolios and having a great analyst like Claudia with us now, and, um, you know, we put together our own managed accounts which clients can very transparently see exactly where their money is. It's a full portfolio solution and it um, has a mixture of, all the asset classes in there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. one of the um, one of the things that uh, you know obviously drives change was the you know the the, the investment managers of those equities, for example, um, you know shareholder meetings and, and driving those outcomes. But I guess the other side of that is also lending and debt. You know, these companies wanting to borrow and then uh, and then having those uh, lending and debt style of um, uh, products available. 
Yes, um, and and I think um, there there a lot of these uh, green bonds, uh, and now we we're hearing about impact bonds as well. So the green bonds, um, we we definitely listened in to some of the issuers talking about what the purpose of the green bonds were. Um, most of it is related to property, uh, we found, but internationally, I think there are there are quite a few opportunities where the green bonds is actually dedicated to companies trying to transition to the net zero, um, and and so I, I believe that trend is going to to um, um, come, you know, start to spread again. Yeah, it's, it seems like that trend's going to start to spread as the as the world uh, makes commitments to to get to that net zero. Yes, yes. So we might be inundated with green bonds. It might be one of those scenarios where um, it becomes the, the new normal, uh, which will be interesting. Yes. Well, I mean, we we could say that you know this is what we are aiming for for green bonds and technologies and that sort of thing to become the new normal, which is what we're we're driving driving here. Yep. Uh, and uh, and how do you uh, – is the technology part of um, those portfolios mostly in equities or are you able to get tech, technology in other areas as well? I think if you're not um, – if you look at it, what is the purpose of these – if you're talking about bonds, uh, is looking at the technology that's invested in it. But the, the purpose of the technology is to drive both cleaner air, uh, higher efficiency, to invest in – Machinery, for example, that can that can um, that operates differently to traditional old style factories, for example. Um, so these, so in that sense, it's, that's where the technology piece comes in. But more, the issuers of those bonds don't necessarily have to be technology manufacturers. They could be just, it could be an, lenders. Le, no, it could be just any companies right. that 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 are trying to that are in that space. Now, Claudia, you're obviously you're an analyst, obviously, and your your full time role is to go in and investigate and find the uh, find the answers to a lot of these um, issues and, and solutions and, and things that the advisors can talk about. For uh, for advisors listening to this, though, where can they go to sort of find out some of this information? I know there's a and you know we're trying to avoid the, the you know avoid the marketing companies are around uh, the greenwashing side of it, but where can advisors go to find out some you know deeper information? So on a on a managed fund side, um, the fund managers and the um, you know business development managers who come out to meet with advisors, they are a great source of information, and and you know a good way is not just about the conversation that happens in a in a meeting room. It also you want to see that comes through in the reports, the updates. Uh, a lot of uh, funds nowadays are also uh, issuing out their impact report. They're where they'll discuss um, what are the activities they've been working on. They'll talk about some of the companies they're having a little, which which present grey areas for them. Have that conversation. You know, sometimes, um, so I guess what I'm trying to say is half of it is what's written in the report and the other half is in your communication and conversations with the fund managers. And, and those conversations that you that you have with the fund managers, sometimes they're out doing amazing things in in communities and the, in running the looking for investments, and they explain what they're doing and the sort of issues that they're trying to target. They're great conversations to have with your clients. You know, as an advisor, you can say, "Look, I spoke to the the fund manager from this particular fund. They're doing this in." in South Africa or whatever it might be, or they're trying to solve this problem of pollution and they're, they're trying not to have too much plastic waste because, and they're investing in this type of company to try and have that solution. And that's a really powerful conversation to have with your clients. And the other spot is, sorry, the other spot is the Responsible Investment Association, the, the RIAA, and um, there's a lot of resources there as well. Wonderful, thank you. That's uh, that's the Responsible Investment Association of Australasia, I believe. Is yes, that correct? correct. Yes. Um, so, so that's that's incredible. Thank you. So, then again, that then comes back down to the understanding where they are on the spectrum of dark versus light. Are they leaning uh, leaning towards or pushing towards um, things becoming deeper green? But I guess that influence doesn't happen uh, overnight. They might need to start from a light light position and, and then move towards deep over time. Mm. And so I mean, part of the, well, Claudia's role as, as our analyst and researcher, she she looks at, looks at the the various different fund managers, looks at who complements the other investments that might be in the portfolio, and like we said earlier in the previous um, session, it, 
our clients want to know where their money is invested. So we're as transparent as we possibly can be in terms of finding out where the investments are actually placed. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much, Claudia and Michelle, for joining us. Uh, now, now, Michelle, if somebody wants to continue that conversation and know a bit more about uh, ethical investment services, how can they get hold of you? Well, where you can Google me or ethical investment services. We're based in Q in Melbourne, so that's where we are. We've got a website, Ethical Investments with an S, and um, you can find us there. But the old Google later, as they say, that'll that'll find us. That's a new term that we're uh, we're bringing on, is it? <laughs> Google later, excellent. Yeah. You, heard, you heard it here first. Yeah. Jump on that one. Uh, thank you so much. Really appreciate your your time, energy, uh, and being part of the series. All right, that's been great, Fraser. Thanks, Fraser. Welcome back to the conversation, Grover. Excellent. Happy to be back here again. Now we are talking about asset classes and all the different asset classes. Uh, looking at the the generally. The go-to has always been sort of equities in this space. Uh, however, to you know, create a balanced portfolio, we um, need to consider everything else. Yeah, a- a- absolutely. And it's a question that, that we at PIMCO naturally as, a, as an active fixed income manager often receives for w- what's happening in the fixed income space, what's happening in areas outside of, of public equities where there's more familiarity. And at PIMCO, we have a very, at PIMCO, we have a very active alternatives platform, of course, real estate platform as well. And in one area where I... I, I in particular, I like to emphasize really is the the growth and the progress of the green bond market. Uh, we, we've, we spoke in one of our previous sessions about labeled bonds broadly, but but with a particular focus there on, I think, social bonds. Uh, but, you know, green bonds are a tool that they've become established in the utility space. They've become established in, in REITs. Uh, they, they've become quite commonplace in a few parts of the market. But what's been really exciting this year so far is, is their increased utilization in other parts of the market. Um, areas where there hadn't been as much issuance before, and that extends beyond corporate bonds. That extends into its mortgages. That extends into into um, municipal bonds here in the states. It extends to multilateral development banks in different parts of the marketplace. Many issuers who have increasingly made this part of their primary market activity, and and that's a great tool for the fixed income market because uh, just with the regular market access, with the road shows and investor conversations that accompany those. With the need to build those books, um, it provides a natural point of, of engagement. It provides an opportunity for an active manager like Pimco to, to really speak with management, um, to speak so at a time which which where they have their freshest and most recent information at hand as, as they've produced uh, a framework, a, a green bond framework to, to accompany that issue as they've studied and, and, and hopefully tried to maximize utilization of green bond principles. And then it gives us an opportunity to give feedback, right? To tell them what we what we like about the structure, what we like about their business plan, um, give give an assessment on how we view the materiality of what they're doing, and, and then to to also you know just emphasize the fact that we look forward to to it feeding into their overall sustainability strategy and more information. And so it's a great it's a it's a great evolution um, for the ESG space in the fixed income market specifically, and, and we look forward to, to hopefully continuing to to promote and sponsor growth in that marketplace, speaking with issuers about it and, and then being active participants in, in those bonds on behalf of our investors. Yeah. So it's, it's not as simple, is it? It's not just uh, a green bond is a bond that invests in something that's that's uh, for the environment. There's a lot more to it. No, that's right. And, and at PIMGO, we have uh, an entire framework by which we, we analyze a green bond structure itself um, because they, they can be distinct from the overall ESG profile of the company or the issuer of the, of the structure of the security. Um, we look at, at what uh, a structure has included in terms of eligible categories where the proceeds can be allocated. We look to the extent that these structures are mapped or connected to specific sustainable development goals or SDGs. We, we look at, at the overlap of, of those eligible categories with the, the primary business activity of, of the company. And we look at, you know, will this be used for new investments, new projects, um, new, new endeavors on a go forward basis, as opposed to being allocated to, to investments that have already taken place. Um, and there are other factors we consider as well. But the point is, is that these structures can be, can be complex enough where it's not overwhelming. Um, you know, it, it needs to be, these things need to be accessible tools for the marketplace. But they do, they're, they're, with the Green Bond principles in PIMCO, we also have best practices available on our own website that we regularly distribute. There is enough information in these frameworks to really be able to, to judge and compare 
and hopefully encourage best practices across the board. Yep. They mentioned social bonds as well. Uh, are they a completely different um, sector or is it pretty much, you know, we they form, they fall under green bonds or are they a separate sector? Well, we, we look at ESG labeled bonds overall as, as the sector heading. And then within, within that, there are green bonds, which are, are focused on environmental related projects for a utility company that can be investing in the construction of a solar farm um, for, for a REIT that can be in the development of a, of a new office building that's going to be LEED Platinum. Um, in contrast, a social bond will have use of proceeds that are related to more social-related endeavors. That can be for financial institution lending to certain certain um, borrower types, borrower classifications uh, that have had less access to credit in the past. It can be to to, to hopefully financing or supporting um, the movement of a, of a workforce or a part of a workforce um, into areas that are more in line. With a more stable business strategy, um, staffing, reallocating staff and resources, and then we have sustainability bonds, which which are being you know increasingly used even just this year, which are a combination of social and green. Um, they may be eighty percent green, twenty percent social. It could be fifty fifty, but they're by by use, being used by issuers who, who want to do a little bit of both, and that's a good development as well to have that additional flexibility. Um, and then Latin, you know, across those three, green, social, sustainability, we call those use of proceeds bonds because they all, right, have the issuers specify where they intend to or where they are allocating the proceeds in contrast to sustainability link bonds where the proceeds are not specifically allocated to projects or eligible project categories, but instead they're linked to, to sustainability goals and targets and objectives. Um, and specific milestones that accompany those. And, and those are being, sustainability link bonds are being used by a range of issuers as well. You know, I, I, I chunk this back down to the client and I feel like that use of proceeds bonds is a great way for them to be able to tell their friends at a barbecue about what they're investing in and why. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You, 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 it's great because you have line of sight to where your proceeds are going. Um, and naturally, you know, this is just one part of, a, of an issuer's capital structure. But as, as, as the market continues to grow and expand and these become increasingly utilized and they represent more and more of the liability side of the balance sheet, then this has, this does have positive domino effects. They represent more and more of the marketplace, more and more of, 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 of the capital structure. Um, and, and obviously the clear goal of all this is that it hopefully drives more activity in some of these, some of these areas. Yeah, absolutely. Now you mentioned alternatives before. Uh, what sort of things are you looking at with, uh, with alternatives in the space? Yeah, so when it comes to alternatives, and you know, there, there's far less availability, of course, of, of, of third-party data, um, of, of data sources such as an MSCI or Sustainalytics. Um, you're, you're dealing with with much less information from the direct counterparties, right? Most private investments um, that the market's pursuing, they, they they're unlikely to have a 50-page sustainability report. So, so there it becomes much more, more of, a, of, a, of a diligence effort, much more of, a, of an internal assessment effort. Um, and that's critically important as well, right, to, to ensure that we're, we're, we're still using many of the tools that we use on the public side, public investing side of our business here at PIMCO, um, but extending that to, to identify material themes and relevancies when it comes to alternatives. And then increasingly, you know, pursuing opportunities uh, for our, our broad alternatives platform in areas of sustainability and doing so um, not because we're focusing on some specific impact-oriented outcome for the fund, but because these are just very significant capital investment opportunities. Uh, there's a lot of disruption going on in the space, and much of that is being done um, in, in private debt, private equity parts of the marketplace, and, and those are great opportunities. Yep. Now, uh, we'll probably right round this off with those REITs and property that you mentioned uh, earlier. Tell us about some of the projects you're seeing in that space that uh, that you like. Sure. So, so yeah, I know it reads and, and, you know, really there it, it comes down to the, the energy efficiency of, of the property of the asset, um, whether that be office space, whether that be a uh, data center, whether that be a, an industrial building, um, is it being, if it's new construction, is it being developed to a standard, right? That has maximum energy efficiency. That's, it's utilizing uh, water and electricity from sustainable, um, and sustainable sources. And to the extent that it's a, it's a seasoned asset or an existing asset, um, is there any sort of, of capital revitalization plan or refurbishment being, being done? Um, and that can be, that can be judged on an absolute basis or, or can be compared across various pathways such as, such as CRIM and others, um, that are aligned with, with specific targets over time. 
Um, so, so that's one of the REIT space and, and that's exciting, you know, that, that more and more has to be done in real estate because just the, the construction itself of a, of a, of a real estate asset uh, can be very carbon intense. Um, and so we do have to think about the full life cycle of these assets. Uh, but with regards to the green bonds and proceeds, um, that, that's been um, the, the market standard. Uh, that's in contrast to something like, like utilities where, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not business as usual in the sense of, you know, trying to make a, uh, a natural gas fire power plant more energy efficient, but just outright moving to clean energy, outright moving, moving to alternatives. And there you certainly want to see it on the lines of, okay, well, if, if, if fossil fuel generation has made up X percent of your, of your generation mix or your capacity over the last 5, 10, 20 years, what's that going to be in the future? Um, you know, to some extent, utilities are going to grow either way and you can develop new green assets by still keeping all the old capacity online. Um, but are you, are you converting some of the old capacity? Are you, are you decommissioning some of that old capacity? Um, are you phasing out coal? There's much conversation at COP26 about phase out versus phase down. But we certainly want to see the phasing out of, of some of these particularly dirty assets over time. And, and so what, what are the green proceeds doing, not only in terms of the new projects, but how does that fit into the overall mix of assets? Um, and, and then, you know, like I said, what's, what's particularly exciting is that you know, it's, these are sectors that are that are very difficult, but we're seeing more happen in other areas, right? We, we've seen green bonds now come out just even in recent days and weeks in areas like shipping, um, the shipping space, um, very carbon intense, using very, very dirty fuels, but either by using different types of, of ships um, and using different types of fuels, what can be done there in terms of putting those on a, on a cleaner on a cleaner environmental path in the future. And, and then also... What's been really exciting is seeing a lot of ESG labeled bond issuance from sovereigns. And that's another unique aspect of the fixed income space. You don't have equity in a sovereign, you don't have equity in a government. Um, but many different uh, governments and sovereigns issuing these types of structures. And that's not exclusive to developed markets, that's emerging markets as well. Um, countries such as Colombia and others coming with these structures, utilizing them um, in order to change how their country operates, change. Um, access to, to many of these power to, to, to tools and utilities by their communities and populations, and, and again, hopefully, doing so in a way that that's that's accompanied with various policy initiatives and other changes at the, at the national level. Well, wow, absolutely, so much happening in the space, and and as you mentioned before, a lot of moving towards, a lot of influencing, uh, you know, phasing down, phasing out uh, conversations, and it's it's really incredible that uh, you know the journey. I think it's pretty exciting that the journey that you're on from where you're sitting. We're excited about it, and, and you know, like I said, we 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 judge, we compare, we evaluate um, all of these opportunities, all of these structures, these issuers. But but what's most important is that right, this is an inclusive space um, that that we're we're bringing more into the fold. We're not scaring issuers away because they, they view it as intimidating or they view it as as an area where they're going to put themselves at reputational risk. Um, we want to make sure that we're being prudent and and, and diligent in our evaluation efforts. But that also, you know, the, the overarching goal here is to bring more in, to grow this space, to grow these efforts. And, and, that, and that, of course, means, um, you know, impacts on our portfolios and, and, and great outcomes across, across regions and populations and markets globally. Yeah, wonderful. Grover, thank you so much for joining us on this series uh, all the way from California. Really appreciate uh, your time, uh, efforts and energy. Uh, if somebody wants to continue the conversation with you or someone from, uh, from PIMCO, what's the best way for them to reach out? Sure. Well, first of all, I've certainly enjoyed our conversations, Roger, and look forward to, to hopefully continuing these efforts, um, both in the United States and Australia and, and, and across across regions. Uh, I, I am on LinkedIn, so, so please feel free to, to look me up there. And then we have a, a, a team on the ground in Australia um, that we're happy to put anyone in contact with with regards to, to our fund products. Our ESG Global Bond Fund is available in the region and a number of our other capabilities across the platform. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Grover. Thank you so much, Razor. Appreciate it.